Home is where the heart is Heaven knows I didn't get enough And I'm afraid of darkness So life is better when you light me up And I'm ashamed of all of my mistakes For heaven's sakes I've been swinging from the rafters And I don't know if I got what it takes For heaven's sakes Throw me out with all them bastards How are you doing, Dave? Oh, fantastic. Are you fantastic? Super duper. What makes uh, today so great for you? Uh, well, Sundays. Sundays are always good. I love Sundays. Uh, hanging out at the Roses. It's good. Here at the cabin, up in the woods, uh, things are good. Had a dog in my lap for a long time. That was Where'd he go? Crazy. What happened to him? Uh, he got tired of me. He, he, uh, I, I, I start he, pinching after about an hour. He traded up. He went to the fireplace, and now he's sitting there in front of the fire. Um, Dave, yes. I, uh, you and I have been um, friends and family for a long time. Yes. Uh, this is embarrassing. Uh, but I was interviewed, and uh, I wanted to play that interview. Wait, I don't remember that. What? I don't remember that happening. It's not a part of this. Me? You mean I interviewed you? You did not. No. I wish you had. Who, who did this? Uh, this is part of the Hungarian uh, NPR. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty popular. Uh, I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty popular in my own self. So in Hungary, in Budapest, uh, I was interviewed uh, by NPR there. And uh, this is that interview, and I thought I'd play it because this happened to me. I used to work for the Naval Postgraduate School. All right. And they asked me a few questions. I was going to give them all the work I had ever done in an archival system. And that piqued their interest, and so they wanted to talk to me about it. All right. That sounds great. It's super great. And uh, are you asleep already? No, I'm not. <laughs> Man, I, I, that hurts. All right, this is Judith Sedillos um, with the Dudley Knox Library, and I'm here with Irene Berry. Yes, this is Irene Berry. We are going to interview Matthew Rose, um, who has worked for MPS for 10 years and is giving us a copy of all his work from the past 10 years. And he will help us um, get a better sense uh, of what his career has covered here. Good morning, and today is um, November 22nd, um, 2011. It's a Tuesday morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Rose, and I have worked for the Naval Postgraduate School for nearly 10 years. It would be 10 years this February. I started um, February uh, 2002, and uh, I started working for uh, one of the centers here, and then that kind of grew into a more comprehensive design uh, job over the last decade. And uh, Matt, I know this, but uh, would you explain how you ended up at MPS? What was... Um... Yeah, I, I worked for a marketing uh, advertising agency in Santa Cruz uh, before that. I've been in marketing and design for about 10 years. And then 9-11 uh, happened, and um, uh, the next day, our boss uh, let everybody go. Um, he thought that that was it. The, it was the end, so it was time to go home. So uh, I had just bought a house, and we were uh, pregnant with my first little child, and so it was a very scary time. And I had a friend here at the Naval Postgraduate School. His name is David Rebont, and he was doing some... Um, IT stuff, uh, sort of technical stuff for uh, the Center for Information System Security and Research. And uh, they started asking him to do more and more design stuff. And he said he knew of an unemployed designer uh, that might be able to do the job. So uh, I interviewed for that job. I got it. And uh, I began working here. And uh, it was a surprise turn for my life and, uh, and an exciting one. What was your first assignment? Yesterday, you were, uh, as we were talking about your work, um, you got to think about the very first job that you had done for MPS. Yeah, I was submitting to you uh, a list, a comprehensive list of everything that I had uh, worked on since I'd been here. And the first thing is um, a project at that time was called Sim Security. It went on to be call, called Cyber Siege. Um, it's a video game. Um, and they were seeking funding for that, and they were leaving for the Pentagon the next day. So they needed about 40 images, I think 40, 20 or 40 images, to show what they wanted that game to look like. So I went home that night and 
and made up uh, these images, and they took that um, and they got the funding they needed, and uh, that that started my career. And um, oops, sorry, I was all, okay, I have more <laughs> questions. Okay, <laughs> so you have uh, over the span of these ten years worked for a variety of uh, groups on campus. Can you can you recount all of them? <laughs> it's a little early in the morning for me to remember them all. I, I started working for Scissor, uh, for Cynthia Irvin, and then uh, I went from there to research department, um, Did uh, worked a little bit for the Myers Institute. Then uh, they began to really put a lot of effort into institutional advancement, and I happened to be at the right place at the right time to uh, help out with um, uh, the school in general and marketing itself. and and um, looking more uh, cohesive as a brand. Uh, and then from there, uh, went to the SMART program, which is a scholarship for service program, and um, helped them with making commercials and, and um, branding themselves and, uh, and pushing that information out to the world. Um, I know that um, for a lot of your time, um, as I know at, at least at the time um, I met you, you were a hired hand a lot, uh, for anybody who needed some design work done. So did you mention you had done some work for moves as well? I did moves, right. What happened during my hired hand phase was uh, that I, um, anybody who needed help on campus, uh, I was sort of uh, a vetted person on campus already that could easily pick up uh, a design job and do it um, and get the job out the door quickly. So that that wound up being pretty useful for a lot of groups, including Moves, uh, to, to um, create posters for events. And uh, there was a lot of conferences on campus, and I was able to make all the materials for the conferences and that type. One of the things that we spoke about yesterday seemed important to uh, capture here today, and that was that you were here at a real turning point as NPS began to see itself as a cohesive whole that needed a branding about mm -hmm. it. And you were involved with the development of the NPS logo as we know it today in uh, 2011. Can you talk a little bit about transition to that logo? Yeah, there was, um, I'd gotten a, an email saying that uh, NPS was looking to begin uh, developing a logo. Um, there was a concern that every department and every entity on campus and every um, small little cluster of people were making their own brochures and their own posters and uh, to the outside world we looked a little bit insane. We didn't look like we all came from the same uh, structure and so uh, the part of that was was deciding on a logo. They had hired a company called Full Steam Marketing, uh, an amazing group, and I was part of a group of about six people who worked with Full Steam um, to give them guidance and at the time NPS, and I think we still have it, uh, has a, had a crest, uh, a very detailed it looked like a family crest. It's got an anchor and a chain and a laurel and and uh, a lot of Latin on it. And it's very complex. It's beautiful and very complex, but doesn't function as a logo. So we had to explain what a logo does, the job of a logo, which is uh, to very quickly get an idea across and can work at any size and any color and uh, on anybody's computer. So the crest didn't, didn't fit that functionality. So developing a logo is very tough. Um, and uh, the marketing team was, was great, and we were able to go through probably 20 iterations before we settled on the logo that NPS now has. Do you remember who else was on that group with you? I don't. I don't remember that group. Um, I was thrown into that group, and um, I was sat quietly in the corner until I felt like I had something that I could add, and uh, I, could, I could go back and find that list of people, but I don't know offhand. It's okay. Um, Another thing I know you had worked on was the Centennial Timeline. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you had actually worked with um, our special archives and John Sanders for some of the materials. And I know that it was a tight turnaround time. Uh, can you tell us more about the, the process of creating the timeline? This, this is a design that actually became an architectural feature and a historical document along the length of Root Hall. That's right. Root Hall um, is a central building on campus. It's a low, long building. I'm not sure the exact length of it, but it's very long and, and sort of frames in the courtyard area of, um, of the campus here. And uh, John Sanders uh, came up to me one day and asked if I'd be interested in, in creating something more permanent for that building. And uh, he uh, had talked about a centennial timeline, laying down a very complex um, uh, network of information 
on a board. People could walk the length of the building and see the past hundred years what led NPS to be what they are now. And uh, so we um, we sat down and looked at that, and I think uh, I believe Dale Kuska was there and uh, Erica Olson, and we began to try and figure out what, what we wanted for that. And that was a that was uh, probably the most complex job I've done in my life uh, to lay down something that. Uh, would be would be permanent and uh, and factually correct uh, because it's going to be scrutinized every day uh, and then have it be aesthetically pleasing and to come up with um, a, a background element or or some sort of framework that would work regardless of whatever information they gave me because until the information showed up I didn't know obviously what was going to be on each of those panels eight foot panels so it was exciting. And I think there was, I remember you talking about um, having to convince people about the placement of the logo on each individual slide. And I think, uh, not to be discounted, your expertise in uh, working up something in electronic format and having that vision of what that actually is going to look like once you blow it up to um, life-size printed bolted to the wall elements. And I think you mentioned there had been a question about how many times the logo should appear or where it should appear. That's right. There was uh, one of the many discussions we had about about that. When I'm just when I'm showing these these displays that are meant to be uh, four feet high and eight feet long or five feet high, um, but I'm showing them on a small PowerPoint or I'm printing out an eight and a half by eleven. The logo looks very very small, uh, and then I'm handing forty sheets in. So then not only is it small, but it looks like it's everywhere. So um, it's the opposite of what people are expecting. They're expecting one big logo at the end, or what have you. So. I was saying, well, you have to imagine you're walking through a courtyard um, that's you know the size of a football field, and these logos are going to be about the size of a silver dollar. Uh, so uh, they are going to be an element on each board, so that each board stands on its own. Would one get published in a magazine? It can stand up on its own, and yet it's part of a larger picture. So I'm trying to think that way, um, thinking that something that's modern, lasts forever, looks vintage. You know, trying to bring all these elements together was. Uh, was tricky for me and exciting. And I think there was then a, a follow-up challenge of uh, putting that theory into practice uh, for a printed book that I don't nece you don't necessarily uh, had any you didn't have any knowledge of when you created the panels. Right. When we first made the panels, there was no um, talk at that time of creating uh, like a coffee table type book. Um, uh, my understanding is that the panels were popular enough that um, that people wanted uh, to take home a copy of themselves. And so um, it wound up being uh, Kerry Miglaw and Erica Olson and I putting together uh, that book. And so each panel is actually different in, in the book. We had to adjust the, the logo size and font size. And, and so to the naked eye, they look like the same panels, but they're actually um, considerably different in the, in the book. And it was neat to put together all the elements of that book and get it officially published and, and have it out in the world. And, and one that was handed to Leon Panetta when he when he arrived here just uh, just recently, and you know I was really really proud of that. You know, it was exciting. It's been a really nice moment. Yeah. Yes, um, I know that you have done a variety of um, uh, projects uh, from instructional movies to brochures, identity packages. Um, was there one that you mentioned the timeline being the most complex? But did you have a favorite one out of all those? If you had to pick one, uh, my favorite project that I was ever involved with was uh, the Glasgow extension. Uh, the Glasgow building here um, was a very moderate-sized three or four-story building with basement, and they wanted to add two extensions on there as a long-term plan to um, create a central hub for uh, computer science department. And so uh, I got the chance to be on the committee uh, for interior design of one of those uh, Glasgow extensions, the first one. Um, and so we got to pick, of course, you know, f uh, carpet coloring and paint and all, you know, every possible little, what the nameplate's going to look like. Every, everything, there's a choice, of course, that needs to be made with those. But um, then they, they, uh, somebody approached me and asked if I would create uh, wall art. And uh, I'd always uh, wanted to be, uh, you know, a, what I feel is like a you know a real artist, you know, <laughs> instead of just making uh, business cards and brochures. So this is an opportunity. I said yes right away, and then of course lost a lot of sleep, uh, wondering what it was that we would be making for those walls. Um, so uh, I think we made 
40 uh, pieces for the walls there. There are 40 inches uh, by 40 inches, most of them. And um, on about 10 of them, I put uh, secret uh, messages in there and codes and um, puzzles. And um, uh, if you sit there and look at a lot of them, you'll find layers of, of information that's sort of hidden in there that have different security concepts embedded inside them. And so, so they're not just a pretty picture of a butterfly, but there's, there's something going on in each one of them. Uh, so for me, it was it was thrilling. And um, I know that there was a computer science theme for these, for the most part. Um, who was it that you were working with? I know that you had worked with uh, Scott Cote was my uh, you know my direct um, uh, point of contact with that, and so he had to first approve the images, and then that went on to the building committee. It had to go on to some other people who who voted on on my art by consensus, which always. Uh, it's a scary and confusing feeling. Um, so, yeah, we had a couple things we had to tie in. We had to tie in computer science, uh, security concepts, Monterey, um, and then the elements, earth, wind, fire, rain, whatever, air. And so um, I tried to tie all those in and, and have it not look clunky, you know, and be able to have it just stand up on its own as something that looks nifty if a kid were to walk by and just see it and think, neat. Um, and then also kind of stand up on maybe a... Um, intellectually compelling way. Nice. Um, one more thing that I know I wanted to ask you about is uh, a project you mentioned um, yesterday had to actually be put into use right after you created it uh, for Katrina. So you mentioned something. Yeah, it was just neat. There was a, uh, I think it was a thesis, a couple of students working on a thesis about what if we could make a, um, a basically take a, a motorhome, a used uh, motorhome uh, camper and uh, gut it and convert it into a totally mobile self-healing network in an emergency circumstance where everything's been shut down. Um, and it was meant for uh, maybe not a natural catastrophe. It was meant for perhaps something uh, catastrophic happened and uh, the police couldn't talk to the fire department and they couldn't talk to the FBI and nobody could figure out what's going on. This vehicle could roll in on the scene and be a self-contained, self-healing network. Uh, they were allowed to turn on security and turn off security so that uh, different elements, different uh, uh, groups of people could talk to each other, but then they can shut those accesses down again so you didn't fully give information to everybody involved in an emergency situation and then now they have access to information maybe they shouldn't. So I believe it's called the Nemesis van and uh, so my job, they walked up to me and said, can you, uh, we have a, 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 like a trade show tomorrow, can you make a, a toy truck, you know, for us? And of course I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan of trucks so I said yes and then again lost sleep, how am I going to do that? Um, so I designed a, a essentially a Winnebago, uh, Barbie doll sized uh, Winnebago that you could pull the lid off of and then you could see all the computers in there and you can get, it was a hands-on concept so so that folks could just walk right up, they didn't have to deal with a computer or anything, they could hold this toy truck, look at it and say, this is a cool idea. And, you know, you put a cool paint job on it and that whole thing. And um, the people I did that for were very, very happy because they immediately, immediately got funding for it and then that became a real uh, thing that I got to go inside of and think, well, I, you know, I had some impact on this. Uh, and then Hurricane Katrina happened, and there were a lot of people in a lot of need. And one of the first assignments that this uh, this Nemesis vehicle uh, worked on was helping um, uh, save lives in Hurricane Katrina. So, um, you know, I, uh, my little drawings uh, had some impact. You know, you you don't think that when you're in your your room uh, designing a uh, uh, something that it would it really have a direct impact on people's lives. And this this was one of those things where I could say I had a tiny, tiny, tiny hand in something much greater, and, and I was I was proud to be a part of that. Okay. Will you happen to know if anybody has the model? Did you do just the the design on on it, you know as, a, as an image, or did you actually build the model? I built it uh, in my garage at home. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so you know, it all it all worked. Um, you know, I, I wanted it to, to look cool, so I spent a lot of time on it, and and uh, it, it was a physical model. I'm holding my hands up at about, you know, a foot and a half long, and it li literally was something that, um, you know, I think an action figure could sit inside, and and uh, so that went, somebody somebody liked it. I saw it sitting in a, in a room here on campus for probably four or five years, then one day it disappeared, and I imagine somebody probably Aww. took it home, or... 
it went into the trash. It I was, you know, where it fell apart. You know? I just wish that we could find that. That would be a really cool collection for... Well, I have the skins for it, what I call the skins for it. So each, I have the digital file, which would be, like if I handed it to you, it would be like a, um, a cutout book, a paper doll cutout book. Mm -hmm. And so you could cut out and assemble your own Nemesis van if you wanted. Uh, <laughs> uh, so all those Here's parts are idea. there. <laughs> yeah, make, all, make your own. Well, um, I, I just want to make sure I didn't miss a question that I really wanted to ask. Um, yeah, there were two questions that I prepared, and I'm, you know, we can maybe decide if we had covered this. What was your proudest time, your proudest moment at MPS? Um, my proudest moment, my, you know, my proudest moment at NPS was working uh, down at Camp Roberts. They had... Uh, um, uh, set up an exercise where several Marines were going to um, reenact sort of a real world situation. They have a lot of buildings down there and, and uh, a lot of equipment that all needs to talk to each other. Uh, extraordinary range of equipment and, um, and people. And uh, uh, so I'm way out in the middle of nowhere with my little red pickup truck. You know, I'm just driving this way out in the off road, in the middle of nowhere with these Marines, and they have all this, uh, these backpacks on. They're just amazing guys. And then they had these um, PDA type, uh, you know, personal display unit uh, type of thing that uh, were prototypes. I'd never seen anything like them. And, and so we were there trying to help these, these Marines because this was stuff that was going to go right over to Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, these guys had a lot of concerns about them. We were able to address those concerns. And, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, I said, well, okay, we're going to head back to the uh, the base or wherever. And so I hopped in my truck. What I didn't expect was that all the Marines would hop in the back of, of my truck. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had the most, uh, you know, precious cargo I'd ever had in my mm -hmm. life, you know, and here these guys have been through so much more than I'd ever be through, but I didn't want to be the guy that bounced them out of the back of the truck you know, <laughs> and hurt them. So, uh, so they probably had the slowest ride back to camp they'd ever had because mm -hmm. I was careful over every bump. I just didn't want to hurt any of these guys. Um, I had such respect for them. So that probably was my, my proudest moment. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. Very good. Um, one more, and it might not be an easy one. How would you like to be remembered for your 10 years here? Uh, you know, I, I, I like being useful and I would like to, a part of handing off this collection of stuff is not to, uh, immortalize myself, but to actually have it, um, it's, it's a huge, to me, it's a huge resource of stuff that people can pick through and grab and use. I mean, I have every variation of the NPS logo and I have got, um, all the stuff I did for scissor and the, and the, the animations for the, uh, um, sim security, cyber siege, uh, movies and and video game and and so um there's an ethics cd that i thought was uh that could still be used i mean it's just to me it seemed timeless and so um i would like to be known professionally i'd like to be known as somebody who um always said yes and found a way to get something done um uh, and didn't pick fights you know and wanted to um find a way to get to do it you get to get something um across the finish line and um, I'd like my stuff to be remembered as, as useful, maybe not particularly brilliant or uh, stunning, but, but something that people can pick up and use. So uh, tools, tools people can, can have and use. So, um, and if somebody could say uh, Matt Rose did that, then, of course, that could, it flatter, flatters the ego. So <laughs> not against that. I think that's all doable. Well, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I'd like to say we're very proud to receive your collection to the library and honored to be able to archive it. So thank you for speaking with us today. Mm -hmm. This is Irene you. Berry. And this is Judith Cedillos. And I'm you. Matthew Rose, and I appreciate the honor. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. I, I tell you what, um, I've heard a lot of interviews uh, about from librarians yeah. on archival systems. <laughs> And I can honestly say, out of all of them, yeah. that's the most recent. <laughs> so, I'm, I am oddly proud of my ability to archive digital files. Um, I don't think it's going to have any lasting value. But I, 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 I'm kidding, of course. Uh, if you looked at how I archive, it would appear that at one point there might have been archived, and then some sort of finder bomb exploded <laughs> and they ended up everywhere uh, well my naming conventions cannot be beat <laughs> thank you Dave for tolerating uh, no this problem. ego thing I do appreciate it a lot and uh, 
Uh, thank you to the Naval Postgraduate School and Judith Cedillos for interviewing me on this crazy, crazy thing that took place in my life. And uh, what's up for next time on Heartlandia? Hey, if you have any ideas. Um, you know what? I think we're going to travel down a few YouTube rabbit holes. I'm excited about that. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us. 